Hi. Hi. Uh, in the evening, we do uh, evening bell chant, and the, there's a, a mantra at the end, uh, um, mantra of shattering hell. So that's my question. What does it mean to shatter hell? What the hell? <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> there's a story about that which really touched me. Uh, there was a guy who was a soldier in Korea some decades ago, and he decided to, he was very depressed, he decided to kill himself, and he's got a gun. So he climbed up into a mountain, and he was going to shoot himself, and just at that moment, he heard the bell, the evening bell. Here, we only have the small bell inside, but the big temples have these big bells, like two meters high outside and they hit it with a log and it's calling people to practice and they'll start hitting that and then everybody will come up. We have a motok, but most places you hear the bell and you have like 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something and then you're in the Buddha hall and then just as that finishes, the small bell starts. But this guy heard the evening bell and thought of his mother who was Buddhist, and then suddenly felt like he can't kill himself. So that bell shattered his hell. Yeah. Hell's made by our thinking. If you just hear the sound of the bell, where's the hell? And uh, mantra, I don't know, all that stuff comes from uh, Buddha's time, all these mantras. So I don't know if he was just making stuff up or whether... It had some relation to people's energy or what. But uh, uh, there's another story uh, where a samurai in Japan suddenly realized he had killed many people. And he worried when he dies, where will, will he go to hell? And so he went to see this famous Zen master who lived mostly as a hermit. And he bowed to the master and, and said, you know, what is heaven, what is hell? And then this Zen master, who he expected to be so kind, started shouting at him, using all kinds of bad speech and saying, you know, some uneducated moron like you couldn't understand even if, you, if I explained it to you. And he just kept shouting these insults. And then the, the samurai suddenly became enraged and pulled out his sword and was going to kill him. And then the Zen master said, that's hell. And then he's so touched by that, he put the sword down and he bowed to the Zen master and he said, that's heaven. So heaven and hell are made in our minds. And uh, when you have a mind that's suffering or creating suffering, that's hell. And when you have like uh, a peaceful mind or a mind that's concerned about the welfare of others, that's heaven. Even Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within, but most people seem to think it's someplace like Hawaii where you go and you die. <laughs> it's your own love mind. Harmony with land. You know, a lot of buildings are trying to get away from the earth. You know, a lot of religious buildings are like, let's get up and out of here. But Buddhist buildings become harmony with nature and they're painted nicely often or they're very nice wood. And you get a good, so your eyes get a good feeling. Or like in the Buddha hall, you look at the paintings there. There's so, there's so many nice paintings, you know. And so it makes your eyes feel very peaceful. And then you hear the sound of the bell or the moktak or the chanting, except for our chanting, which is still pretty bad. <laughs> but maybe after a couple weeks, everybody's mind will come down and it'll become more smooth. <laughs> but right now, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> What's everybody thinking about every day? But in any case, you know, then, then you, or the birds, okay, the birds, even the wacko birds, or, you know, the little, what's the little cat that mostly, they just walk around every once in a while. Wah, wah. You know, cats don't me meow at each other. They meow for humans. I don't know what they want, but, you know, <laughs> every once in a while you hear them doing that, you know, and then your ears feel good. You know, especially Koreans love to hear a mok talk when they pass by a temple. Mm 
you know. And um, incense smells good, you know. And the food usually tastes good. And then the atmosphere in the mountain feels good. So your five senses are rested. Then you can start to address what we're making with our thinking and try to learn how to rest that, you know, not be attached, not keep making stuff, or if we do have a habit, not be attached to it, not be bothered. I know this monk who's in New York City, American monk, and uh, about 10 years ago, I visited him, and he told me, you know, in the morning, I wake up and the committee starts meeting, and I'm wondering what he's talking about. And then I realize, in his head, there's this whole discussion going on, like, ah, you don't need to get up now. You know, if you get more sleep, it'll be better and everything. And he said, I've been practicing 20 years, and the committee still meets every morning. I just ignore them now. <laughs> so... That's his habit, you know? So it's still going on, but he no longer gets involved with it. You know, it's just some noise, like when the, every once in a while the birds are like, wah, 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 right? Sometimes they're like, baby, oh, that's so pretty. But other times they're really kind of like, they're, they're arguing with each other, <laughs> you know? But it's just like, it's okay. Yeah. So these uh, mantras, and maybe, I don't know, one particularly has this effect or that effect, but they, they all point to this mind that isn't making anything, and that's free from suffering, or that can be, or that even when it suffers, it's not my suffering. It's suffering because we understand and see the suffering of others, and that you can turn into compassion and wisdom. When you're, we're caught by our own suffering, then very hard to digest that and have it turn into, uh, you know, compassion and wisdom and action. So that's what that's about. So someday maybe you're really suffering somewhere and you're walking through some town and you hear a church bell, Dung! and it's like, oh yeah, I remember that time at Musang Sang. <laughs> when I did the bell chant. <laughs> when we moved, uh, we were, uh, for a while, when I came to Providence End Center, it was in the city, and we had a big bell. And we didn't ring it in the morning outside, but we, were, we rang it at, we began the evening chant at 7 p.m. We rang it at 7 p.m. And when we were moving out to the countryside, uh, we hired a truck, and it came, and we took the bell house apart, and then they used a crane to lift the bell up. It was about a ton or more, and put it in the truck. And there was an Irish guy who lived down the road, and he was retired. He had been a policeman. And he came down, and he was watching. You know, old guys, they like to watch that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to drop that bell? Let's see. Does that guy know how to use that crane? You know? And so they're doing it, and we're hanging around talking, and he said, I told my wife, I'm going to miss that bell. I'm going to miss that bell. I can tell, I can tell when it's the church bell or the Buddhist bell. He says, I can hear the difference. I tell my wife, that's the Buddhist bell hidden. You know? so we were just part of the neighborhood. You know? yeah. So that guy got some pleasure from hearing once in a while the Catholic church bell would ring. And every night at 7, our bell would ring. And this old guy got pleasure from that. That's, uh, you know... A mantra breaking hell. Okay? So we have this really great opportunity here because uh, uh, keeping a schedule, practicing on your own, uh, can be very hard alone. But when you're with other people, that gives you extra motivation because, you know, somebody's going to come and, and maybe look for you or, or, you know, your roommate will, come on, it's time for, for bowing, you know? And so uh, it's a great opportunity, and uh, I hope everyone's making the best of it. And whatever's going on inside, uh, this is like a big cleaning machine. If you keep trying, you'll chew it up, and, and uh, uh, benefit will come. Uh, one, one of our monks who's not in Korea anymore, he told me once, he, he grew up in Czech Republic, and when uh, he was uh, 
13 or 14 when communism ended. And he said, suddenly, you could get books about any religion. Before that, you, you couldn't. And uh, in Poland, the Catholic Church is so strong. Even during communism, they couldn't step on it. But in Czech Republic, the churches weren't that strong. And he said, suddenly, all this religion came in. And he was suffering a lot as a young teenager. And he said he went to this church program. And he said everybody was really nice and it was kind of fun. But afterwards, he still felt terrible. But then his brother suggested he go to this three-day meditation retreat with our group. I guess some people would come to Poland to run a retreat from Poland. And he did this retreat. And, you know, it's not easy. Your body hurts, and sometimes your mind hurts, and you're sitting for like eight hours. And he said, you know, he's just miserable the whole time. His body hurts, and his mind's hurt. And then he looked around, and he said, everybody's very nice to me. My seat's right in front of a window. I can look out on the, on the field. He's like, the only reason I'm suffering is because of my own mind. And so he saw that maybe the outside thing was difficult, but when he made this effort, he began to see where his suffering's actually coming from. And it slowly, he said, I felt horrible the whole retreat, but the next week I felt pretty good. <laughs> so may you feel horrible all retreat, and then for the next year feel really great and find your true way, get enlightened, and moment to moment save all beings from suffering. <laughs> Well, maybe you don't have to feel horrible the whole time, but try with some enthusiasm, you know, put some effort into it. Okay, great. <laughs>